Good afternoon, Connecticut College. How's it going? Welcome to the last TED Talk of the day. You've made it through. Congratulations. Look at this beautiful galaxy. This is M64, and it's just part of our universe. From its beginning, its inception, NASA has created, engineered, built, or had contracted all of its launch vehicles. From Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, to the most recent over here, the shuttle, which I grew up with, it has had the independent capability to put humans in space. All that changed in the summer of 2011 when the shuttle was retired. It has been in service for roughly 40 years and my entire lifetime, and it was becoming vulnerable to mechanical and electrical malfunctions. Plain and simple, it was getting old, and NASA was worried about what might happen if it failed. This is the International Space Station. What a wonderful piece of equipment it is. It has been continuously inhabited for 12 years from humans, and has been continually resupplied by the shuttle. It's the size of a football field and exists in low Earth orbit. It's been the hub of human activity, again, for my entire lifetime and probably much of yours. Now, now that the shuttle is gone, though, how are we going to get up there? You know, we've got this amazing piece of technology. There's been so many papers written based on this, and it's still going on right now. It's right overhead. But my point is, now that the shuttle's gone, how are we going to get up there? How are we going to continue to put U.S. astronauts on the International Space Station? And that's what I'm here to talk about today, is the privatization of space. So right now, from 2011, when they grounded the shuttle, until 2015, we, uh, we, the U.S. has partnered with Russia and we'll be using Russian Soyuz rockets, and we are at the moment using Russian Soyuz rockets to put U.S. astronauts in the in, in International Space Station and bring them back home. And in the meantime, NASA has invested millions of dollars into creating the next generation of space vehicles by spurring private industry to invest and create where they have filled that gap before. So in the meantime, NASA has put forth goals with monetary values attached to them, that private industry can go, they can innovate, they can create their own launch vehicles, and when they reach those goals, which NASA has stipulated, so everything is going to be exactly as they need, you know, all the nuts and bolts are going to fit right into the International Space Station when it goes to dock and everything like that. But once they reach those goals, they can collect that monetary prize, and they can continue innovating, and they can go to the next level. So, the best analogy that I can think of for that is imagine this. You are a part of a local government, and you're in charge of bringing the kids to school. Now, much like many other local governments, you decide, we're going to put them on a school bus. Well, some of your school buses are getting kind of old, and you don't want to be responsible for any sort of accident, much like the shuttles. So, what you do is you hire the next town over. You say, for the next couple of years, how about you bring our kids to school? And in the meantime, there are some private companies that are going to be creating the next technologically advanced buses. And when you're done, we'll bring them on those buses. And the good thing about those is that it's going to be a lot cheaper than where it previously was before. Your previous, um, how much money you invested in bringing the kids to school on your old buses, you're not going to have to worry about those anymore because the private companies are going to be taking all the risk and you're going to be overseeing that and they're working for you. So, jumping out of that analogy and back into the space exploration, I'd like to introduce two young shoulders um, that are changing the world right now. On the left here, we have Elon Musk, who started PayPal, and in 2002, sold it to eBay for $1.5 billion. Now, if you did that, and you were his age, well, 
I don't know, you'd never have to work for the rest of your life if you wanted to. You could buy your own private island, you could retire. I mean, your imagination could go crazy. But Elon Musk can't sit still, so he started Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX, as well as Tesla Motors, the electric car company. And he became an entrepreneur at a very big scale very quickly, using his money to better humanity. On the right here, we have David Thompson, who is the CEO of Orbital Sciences Corporation. He co-founded that in 1982 with two other gentlemen. And he got his background engineering advanced space propulsion at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center down in Huntsville, Alabama. Now, what are these guys doing for us as taxpayers? Well, these guys are the ones who are creating our next generation buses, or the, uh, the new launch vehicles that are going to bring astronauts to the International Space Station. Here we have the Falcon 9, which is being developed by SpaceX. Falcon 9 has resupplied the International Space Station with food twice, and through other launches, it has shown that it has the capability to safely bring astronauts to and from the International Space Station. One of the ways it showed that is actually on the top here is a capsule, and it put a bunch of grapes in there to show that anything soft and squishy and delicate would be safe going to the International Space Station and coming back down. Here's a picture of what's called the Dragon Capsule that's going to go on top, and that's what they use to put all the food and supplies in for the International Space Station and what eventually will be humans after the 2015 contract with Russia ends. And here we see it docking with the International Space Station, right above our beautiful Earth right there. Orbital also has several launch capabilities. They are not pursuing the uh, human launch, or bringing humans back and forth, but rather they are going to help by putting satellites into orbit. Now on the left here, we see the Pegasus rocket, it's that small one right underneath this big plane. What happens is that plane takes off, it flies at a very high altitude, and it drops the Pegasus rocket, which ignites on onboard boosters, and blasts it into further orbit to put a payload into space, or usually smaller satellites. And here on the right, the Taurus rocket, it looks like a more traditional rocket that you'd think of. It launches vertically, and it uses solid rocket fuel just like the SpaceX rocket that we saw the video of just before. Now, right on SpaceX and Orbital's tails are Blue Origin, Boeing, and the Sierra Nevada Corporation. Now, they haven't shown that they have the ability to put astronauts into space yet, but NASA knows that they are vying for contracts to put people into the International Space Station, and they're developing technologies to do that right now. This was taken right off of NASA's website page, which is why everything says click to learn more. You can actually click this to learn more. But um, the fact that private industry is innovating for itself and taking initiative to do this is amazing for NASA, because what they can do is they can take money and resources that they were originally putting towards you know, bringing astronauts back and forth, and they can focus on the next generation of exploration and what we're going to do in space, whether it be going to a meteor, looking at a comet, or hopefully going to Mars, uh, they can put resources and time towards that instead. So here is just a very small cross-section of space companies that have emerged. We see here Xcor and Virgin Galactic. Their business model involves bringing tourists into space and bringing them back giving them a brief glimpse at zero gravity and a nice view of the Earth from space, hopefully. Um, here we have Bigelow Aerospace. They're going to be launching a low Earth orbit hotel so people can enjoy, I don't know, a night or two of looking down at everyone here on Earth. And we have Planetary Resources, an interesting company. They hope to mine an asteroid for precious metals and stones. Well, another one I'd like to talk about, Mars One, they have a very interesting business model. Um, they aim to put a colony on Mars, and the way that they're going to do that is by selling a Big Brother-like TV show. Now, if you're not familiar with that, it's basically 24-hour surveillance of anyone living in a house as Big Brother. Well, this Mars One show is going to be about 
showing the complete uh, initialization of this Martian base. And I don't know how they're going to cover it up if something goes wrong, because if someone's you know, gasping for air outside, well, we're going to see it on TV, I guess. So that's going to be... Oh, watch out for that. If that literally gets off the ground, that's, that's going to be one of the most entertaining shows on TV. <laughs> that's, uh, that's just my, my take on it. And the last of these companies I'd like to talk about is Juxtopia. Now, Juxtopia hopes to, to, get, some, uh, to get their name out there on the, the scientific forum by starting a Google Lunar X Prize team, which I'm a part of. Now, if you're not familiar with the XPRIZE Foundation, the basic gist of it is they find a corporate partner, in our case, Google, the Google Lunar XPRIZE, and Google puts forth a pot of money, and they work with the XPRIZE Foundation to figure out a goal or something they want to achieve that's going to better humanity and that is consistent with the, um, I don't know, what their company stands behind. And in this case, the Google Lunar X Prize is all about getting a robot on the moon, having it travel 500 meters, and sending a high-definition picture and video back to Earth. And the only caveats are it has to be done by December 2015, and it has to be done with at least 90% of um, independent funds, not government-sponsored, only 10% at the most. Now, why does the XPRIZE do this, the XPRIZE Foundation? Well, they actually cite on their website some similar companies from the past that have put forth a monetary prize and gotten incredible results. The 1714 Longitude Act in Britain spurred um, oceanic exploration forward, and the 1919 Ortigue Prize actually made Charles Lindbergh a hero because it, its goal was to be the first person, the first person who can travel from New York City to Paris nonstop gets a huge cash prize, which is what spurred uh, Charles Lindbergh to do that and created the aviation industry that we enjoy today. So, what am I doing on the Google Lunar X Prize team, Team Jerbon? Well, one of the groups I'm on is called the Radiation Subcommittee. Now, what I have to worry about that is the sun and other things in the universe create some very harmful radiation, which we enjoy here on the Earth. This is one of the reasons the Earth is one of the only places humans can survive in the solar system, is the Earth has an incredible magnetic field, which channels the particles around to the poles and creates the aurora borealis. So we on Earth are fine, but once something leaves the Earth, it, it's going to be subject to those particles and that harmful radiation. So on the moon, we have to be worried about that radiation getting to our circuits and messing up you know, everything, really. The second committee I'm on is the science subcommittee. Now, the cool thing about the science subcommittee is I get to say, well, our primary goal, of course, is to travel 500 meters. Obviously, that's part of the Google Lunar X Prize. Otherwise, we wouldn't be there. But once we're done with that, we're going to have a bunch of robots on the moon. What do we want to do with that? What's the, <laughs> what are our goals? Um, so I got to brainstorm. I think a couple weeks ago, I was talking to friends, family, anyone I could think of. What do you want to know about the moon that we don't know about? And I was thinking to myself, well, one of the things these robots are going to be doing is they're going to be trying to locate water ice on the moon, even though we already know roughly a bit about that from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and other satellites. Another thing they're going to be looking at is they're going to be bringing spectrographs onto each one of them, which a spectrograph is a little bit like a prism, if you've ever seen Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon with the white light coming in, separating into its constituent parts. That's what a spectrograph is, um, but it can pick up signatures of individual elements and individual molecules that will be very interesting to look at, what the soil's made up of, what, where we can find ice, where we can find other minerals, and we'll also be pointing them at the Earth, at other stars, at the sun, we're pointing them everywhere. We're going to be taking videos. We're going to go crazy with all the data we're going to get. It's going to be great. Um, and the last thing that we're going to put on these wonderful robots is we're going to put 
Gyroscopes and accelerometers. Now, you're familiar with those in your phone because it tells you if you're putting your picture vertical or horizontal, but we're going to use those to study what are called moonquakes on the moon, which, <clears throat> which is um, just like earthquakes here on Earth, moonquakes. And uh, we're going to be able to sense those. We're going to be able to figure out more about what causes them and why they exist and what magnitude they exist. And we'll be able to figure some really cool stuff out. And the last group I'm on is the uh, hazards, the General Space Hazards Subcommittee, which is worried about micrometeorites. These meteorites are flying all around the universe. And you, you saw them recently, the near-miss asteroid that flew 17,000 miles away from the Earth, and the asteroid Chelyabinsk, Russia, that, uh, the meteorite, sorry, that came down in Chelyabinsk, Russia. Um, these are flying all around. You can see them on the moon. They create craters all the time. So we have to worry about these damaging any of our robots or our lander, and I'm part of that group figuring out solutions to that. So, we're on our way to winning the Google Lunar X Prize. Everything has been going smoothly so far, and it's been great, and we really hope there aren't any major hiccups or strange things that go on because they can be disastrous. but I digress. <laughs> this is the team I'm on. If you'd like to learn more about it, Google Lunar X Prize. I'm on Team Gerbon, and we're going to be engineering, innovating, and dreaming, and we'd like you to join us and do that along in your own lives as well, and keep exploring. Thank you. Thank you.